Hi, I am Glenn Hall. Today is April 2nd, 2021. Today is Good Friday, and for the last few days I've been speaking about Passover, Easter, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and uh, prior to this series of teachings, I was beginning to teach a series on the coming of the Kodeshim. And I wanted to share a little bit about that in this video. This is my second video today, but I felt led to go ahead and, and do this. Um, my wife and I have been talking about this lately. <clears throat> it seems as if there has come upon us a a focus toward New Jerusalem, a focus toward not being part of the world system. You know, we're, we're not um, hankering to go on any vacations. The world clearly at this point is under the control of a satanic cabal. Uh, why go into their cities? Why go into their strongholds of debauchery, deception, evil, perversion? And so our focus has really been on seeking the Lord and seeking what his thoughts and will are concerning this time. And a few days ago, I remembered a scripture that I want to share with you about the Lord setting his face like flint to go toward Jerusalem. You find that in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans and make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. In prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, starting at verse 4, it says this, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning my, by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear, to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Now clearly this is talking about Jesus, <clears throat> especially here in verse, uh, verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. And then verse 7, But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Jesus only did what he saw his father doing. And when the time came for his departure, nothing could deter him from that. Nothing could deter him from going to Jerusalem. Have we set our faces like flint toward Jerusalem, toward New Jerusalem, toward our heavenly calling? I want to read to you now a scripture from Philippians chapters 3 and 4. Paul, of course, wrote this. <clears throat> and really, this is quite amazing. And it goes exactly with what I have been teaching lately concerning the, the true meaning of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the man-child, the first fruits, the firstborn, 
the overcomers, the Kodeshim. So starting in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Philippians, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. So dogs is a euphemism for evildoers in the scripture. <clears throat> Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. These were those who were teaching that you had to be circumcised in your flesh in order to ever be a Christian. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am of the people of Israel. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I am a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, I am blameless. Who can say that? But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. This is the key and this is the stumbling stone. There are so many false prophets out right now, but they, many of them are wanting to do righteousness. And they're talking about a time of righteousness that is coming to the earth. And I believe that they're right about that. A time of righteousness is coming to the earth. And I believe a lot of these people, a lot of these people who are, are false prophets at this time will come into that. But the reason why they are false prophets is because they're still teaching that you are going to do it by your flesh. They are stumbling over the stumbling stone, who is Jesus Christ. There's only one way. There's only one way into New Jerusalem. There's only one way into the kingdom. And that one way is Jesus. He is the door. He is the narrow path. He is the word of God. He is our creator. And it's interesting that a lot of people are talking about how the, the name of God, God, the name itself has been uh, abused and misused by the world. And so many people are actually using the word creator when they talk of God now and they don't realize that that creator is Jesus, is. Jesus is our creator. He's the one through whom all things were made. He is the one. So people continue to stumble over the stumbling stone and Paul is making it clear here that it doesn't depend upon the flesh. In the flesh, you are still going to fail in some way. You may be able to get by through some of the nitpicking things of the law and say that you're blameless, but yet when it comes to true love, true mercy, true righteousness, true justice, there is only one that is perfect, and that's a Jesus. Then, very interestingly, the very next verse here in Philippians chapter 3, Paul begins to speak of this first fruits glorification that I've been talking about. In the scripture, the actual way it should have been translated would be the out resurrection. It's a resurrection that I believe occurs while some people are still alive. 
So I'm going to move on. I'm going to read nine chap, uh, verse 9 again, but I'm going to go on to verse 10 this time. For Christ's sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that by any means possible I may attain the out-resurrection from the dead. We now are living in bodies that are dead. We are carnal beings. We live in the flesh. We have touched a dead body. That dead body is us. That's why it's so important to understand the significance of second Passover. I've been talking about first Passover for these last, the last seven videos, but now I'm beginning to talk about second Passover because second Passover was for those people who could not participate in first Passover like Jesus because they were either on a far journey or had touched a dead body. We have all touched a dead body. Therefore, there are going to be some, the first fruits, the firstborn from the dead, who will partake of second Passover on some year. This year, that second Passover, uh, I believe, occurs. The actual second Passover date is, I believe, April 26th. And then the, um, the date of the Feast of First Fruits that would correspond to that second Passover is actually going to be on Sunday, and I think that's April 2nd. So uh, those are certainly a couple of dates to keep in mind, and my prayer is that this is the year that the Lord would do it because our earth is devolving. Our, our government is wicked. Our leaders are wicked. People are dying from the crazy shot that they're making people take. It's just unbelievable what's going on. Now it's very important here, and I want to um, I want to continue reading what Paul said. I'm now at verse 12 of chapter 3 of Philippians. Paul then says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, so he's saying, I haven't obtained this. I'm not perfect. I say the same thing. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in any, anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. In other words, if you don't understand this yet, God will reveal it to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. See, each one of us, we have attained something. To him who has, more will be given. So what you have, use it. What you have, apply it. What you have, speak it. What you have, give it. And then more will be added to you. And that, that's what Paul is saying. And he's saying, if you don't quite understand what I'm talking about here, that's okay. God will ultimately bring you into this understanding. And then he goes on, brothers, join in imitating me. So Paul knew that he was walking with God. I can say the same thing. I know that I'm walking with God. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you, 
and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. He's including people who say that they're Christians here. Their end is, is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. John teaches us, love not the world or the things of the world. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. So he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This is the hope we have, that we will be like him, that we will see him as he is, that we will see God as he is. Therefore, we will have a body like his. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. And now we're in chapter uh, 4. That was the first verse, and I'm going to go to verse 4 now. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You have not because you ask not. Really, when you think of something that's a need that that you have right then, pray about it. When you see your family or friend in a need, pray about it. Ask about it. Let your requests be made known to God. And as as you give yourself to always being cognizant of God's presence, always being cognizant that everything you do is in him, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. You won't be in fear. You won't get into the fear that's really engulfing much of the world right now. And finally, he says here, this is verse 8, Philippians 4, 8. And we really need to take this to heart. We need to do this. It's so important. It has to do with the things that you read, the things that you watch, um, the things that you listen to. Finally, brothers, the things that you say. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Listen to these things. Say these things. Do these things. They should be in our minds and on our hands. This is what God told Moses to tell the people. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And so I want to encourage you, set your face like flint toward New Jerusalem, toward the kingdom of God toward our Heavenly Father, toward Jesus Christ, our Savior. Set your face like flint. Don't look back. Those who look back are not fit for the kingdom of God. Those who look back are like Lot's wife who turned to salt. There's nothing in the world for you. There's nothing no greatness for you in this world that you should aspire to. Of course, we all need a home. We need food. We need clothing. And I pray that God will provide that for all of us and continue to do so. But set your face like flint toward Jerusalem. Jerusalem.